Graham Robertson Lears, your host for this morning. Um, we will be starting shortly. Uh, we're just waiting for just a few more people to arrive. Um, looks like we're almost about 450 people connected. Um, if you could all help us make this run smoothly and just make sure that you keep your webcams off and your microphones muted, that would be a very big help. So, like I say, we should just uh, be ready in a couple of minutes. Good morning to uh, to all uh, of you and uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar. Um, from my side, so I am uh, Elena Tegowska. Uh, I am a team leader in the higher education unit uh, of the DG uh, Education, um, Youth, Culture and Sport. And today I am here with uh, with my colleagues Graham and Harpa uh, on the permission side, and um, of course uh, colleagues from the European University uh, Foundation. Um, so today's uh, webinar is part of uh, of a series of webinars. Uh, it's the third and the last uh, webinar, uh, which will give you updates um, and uh, next steps in the developments of the online learning agreements. Um, and uh, it, it follows the two previous webinars, uh, one on the European Student Identifier and another one on the Erasmus Plus mobile app uh, that took place a few, uh, few weeks uh, ago and uh, that raised uh, really a, a lot of interest. I think we had more than 1,000 uh, participants. So we, we look forward also to, to today's webinar and to have uh, interactive uh, discussions with you. So uh, really don't hesitate to, to post your, your comments or your questions uh, in, the, in the chat box during the presentation, and we will try to uh, address them as much as possible um, during, uh, during the webinar. Um, so before going into um, the, the details on the online learning agreements, maybe a few uh, words about the broader picture, um, especially for those who are maybe not so, so familiar, um, to say that uh, the online learning agreements are part of the broad European Student Card Initiative. Um, and the European Student Card Initiative was actually identified as a key initiative in uh, by the Council in its uh, in the Council conclusions of uh, December 2017, um, as it was indeed identified as a key initiative in achieving uh, swift um, mobility and swift swift exchanges throughout uh, throughout Europe, and as a key step uh, actually in making uh, the European um, education area a reality by 2025. Um, so, in this uh, context, really, the idea is uh, the, the objectives of the European uh, education area is to really boost uh, student uh, mobility and to make the experience of the mobility, but as well as the management of that mobility, as easy and as smooth as possible for students, but also for the higher education institutions. Um, so, as such, the, the European Student Card Initiative actually has, and you can see it uh, here on the screen, two big, uh, really two big objectives. As I said, one part is really to, to have all this uh, mobility management and admi administration um, digitalized and streamlined. Um, and in this respect, uh, the online learning agreements are uh, a major part, uh, part of it. Um, and the second objective is really the, the rolling out of the European student cards and the European student identifier um, to give uh, more swift and easy access to uh, students to any online services in their host institution um, before, even before they 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 arrive physically uh, in in mobility on in that uh, in that host institution. Um, so the initiative, as I. Hello, Elena. It's Graham here. Um, Elena? Yes. Yep, sorry. Hello? You, you muted there for a moment. Um, we could still ah, see sorry. you, but you muted. Okay. I am muted. We can okay. hear you now. Can you hear me? 
can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so yes, I was saying that um, the um, it has been more than two, two years that we have uh, that we are working on the on this uh, initiative, and we are um, obviously um, working for it to be um, as um, important. Um, relevant as possible also in the framework of the future Erasmus Plus program. Um, and in this respect, we really strongly believe that the initiative uh, will be um, uh, a major um, game changer in making the next program more inclusive and, uh, and accessible. Uh, more digital uh, and more sustainable. Um, the, the European Student Card Initiative, through its different strands, uh, through the different features that it is um, enabling for higher education institutions to use, will, uh, will be a, a milestone uh, here. Um, and for uh, the European Student Card Initiative, obviously, uh, you uh, in order to, to progress in a timely and as efficient way as possible, we have um, defined a roadmap for the, the digital uh, mobility uh, management. Um, and here you can, uh, you can take a look at it. Um, the idea is that uh, the, the roadmap um, um, is there as, um, as a, um, a, a structure for the universities to be able to uh, anticipate and to organize uh, everything that needs to be organized. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, and in this respect, the idea is to uh, make it mandatory. So make the, the use uh, of uh, all the online, uh, online uh, documents and of the Erasmus without paper network. Um, indeed mandatory as from the next Erasmus Plus uh, program. Um, obviously, it goes without saying that um, the, the, the use of, uh, of these different features will not become mandatory as long as we are not um, sure uh, and certain that everything is working um, properly, that the different systems are operational, um, and that uh, it is uh, fit uh, for purpose um, for, for the users. But we need to have a, a timeline, we need to, uh, in order to, to progress. Um, and um, here you, you can see that the idea is to start with the mandatory use of online learning agreements as from 2021, followed by the use of interinstitutional agreements as for, from 2022. And here there has been a slight adaptation of this roadmap uh, in view of, uh, of the current COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. Um, the interinstitutional agreements, um, uh, the online interinstitutional agreements were meant to uh, become mandatory uh, before 2022, but this was reviewed. So what you, you see here is uh, really the updated uh, roadmap uh, according to which we are currently uh, currently working. And then the last step uh, there would be in 2023, uh, the nominations and, uh, and transcripts uh, of, uh, of records. To, uh, to become mandatory. So to come back on the to the online learning agreements and uh, to the to the main uh, to the main topic of the of the webinar, as I said, you you and you you saw it in the previous slide. The the idea is uh, for those uh, online learning agreements to become mandatory uh, as from 2021. Uh, hello. We can I don't still know hear if you. I was disconnected, okay. or can you hear me? No, you weren't. It's fine. Keep going. Okay. Can you hear, hear my? Can you see my slides? Um, I'm not looking, but yes, we can. Okay. So, uh, final. Okay, you hear me? Great. Perfect. Um, final mention from from my side. Um, uh, indeed. To say that uh, today we will, uh, colleagues from the European University Foundation will present to you 
the latest developments and the step forward uh, for the online learning uh, agreements. Um, and on our side, we are working on uh, on the transition to the new program uh, within the within the working groups. I see here that some people are saying that you cannot uh, see my uh, my the slide. Yeah. Elena, you seem yes. to have stopped. You seem to have stopped your presentation. We're seeing yeah, the I don't editing know, uh, window. Uh, yeah. Is it but fine if this is now? Your last slide anyway, it is the last slide. Yet. It is the last just slide. Keep going. Just keep going and finish. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I don't know if it's connections problems, but okay, let's uh, let's let's continue. Um, I see here that people cannot hear me. No, we can so... hear you fine. Um, some people have individual connection problems, uh, but oh, okay. the vast majority can hear you okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to help the, people the individually. That's okay. okay. Thanks, Graham. Um, yes. So, so just a final um, mention to um, to tell um, you that what will be presented and Elena, today. Just one second. Yes. You're showing a black slide at the moment. Yes, I know. Uh, it's because it stops. So okay. I don't know why. What, is it maybe it's the connection that is uh, doing this? But is it fine now? Okay. It's okay now. Yes. It switches uh, automatically to the black screen. Okay. But in any case, you saw this slide. I don't have any any more slide. What uh, just I was going to maybe to to end uh, my presentation with is to let you know that today what you you will hear is the latest developments for those higher education institutions that are using um, the dashboard. Let's say in an exclusive way. It means meaning that they don't have any um, IT systems of their in their own institution, or they are not uh, or they are not uh, working with. Uh, with the service uh, providers, um, obviously uh, those as well can uh, can use and continue using what they have developed uh, within their own institutions or uh, in the framework of the what was developed uh, by the by the service uh, providers. Uh, today, what you will hear is um, what is being developed for those higher education institutions that are um, actively using uh, the the dashboard. So it, this will not um, per se impact uh, the, um, the universities that are uh, having their own IT systems or working with the, the, the service providers. What will have an impact on everyone, on all universities, and what we are currently working on is uh, slight adaptations in the template, uh, so meaning in the content uh, of the uh, online learning agreement to adapt it uh, to the novelties uh, of the future Erasmus Plus program. So typically, um, we will have in the future program options for blended mobility, so combination of physical and virtual mobility. We have to see uh, what is the best way to integrate this specific element in the future online learning agreement, but this uh, is not the, the object or the subject uh, of the webinar today. Uh, we will, of course, uh, continue to organize such uh, webinars in order to give you timely information um, and to, to give you enough time to, uh, to be able to adapt to the novelties we are developing uh, independently, whether you are using the dashboard, whether you are using uh, working with a service provider or whether you have your own uh, IT, uh, IT systems within your own institution. So that's it from, from my side. Uh, we will uh, stay uh, in this webinar uh, until the end with my colleagues, uh, Harpa Graham, um, and we will tackle any questions or comments you might have uh, along the way. Thank you again. And I think that Daiga will uh, take the floor now. So, indeed, thank you so much, Elena, for setting the stage. And uh, I will indeed continue. I will just very quickly share my screen and share my presentation. Um, and I also wanted to comment on the, I, I see that the, indeed there are a couple of people who are having the, the problems with the connection. And we want to highlight that we will be recording this webinar. 
So um, in case they, there are issues with the connection and, and you're jumping in uh, slightly later. Um, so there will be a recording. We will also uh, publish the slides themselves and also some uh, summary of the questions and answers. So um, yeah, please, uh, please don't, uh, don't, uh, don't worry that you'll miss something. Um, there'll still be a chance to, to catch up on that. And, uh, and yes, basically warm welcome to the third, uh, uh, third webinar from the Erasmus Growth Digital Series, also from my side. And um, indeed, as you can see here, the online learning agreement is in focus today. And as it is the first of the Erasmus management uh, processes that will be fully digital already from 2021, it is the high time that we give you more updates on, on how we are looking into further evolving it. And the number of uh, updates that will be uh, made available already in the beginning of the next semester. And in line with setting up the stage, um, as Elena very nicely did it, um, I indeed want to highlight that uh, we'll be focusing on the functionalities of the online learning agreement. Therefore, the target audience is online learning agreement current and potential users. So um, if you or your partner are using any other system, be it in-house or third party, the connection to the Erasmus Europe paper network will ensure the interoperability and the smooth finalization of the document across the systems. So it means that you do not have to use the same system, but both of the platforms would, be, would need to be connected to the Erasmus Europe paper network. But so, but what is on the agenda today? A bit more in a bit more detail. I will just move. Uh, yes. So um, first and foremost, what we will do, we will try to illustrate what are the key aspects that need improvement based on the experience and the, the feedback that we have accumulated till now. Then we will try to outline what are the solutions that we have devised based on those shortcomings that we have mapped, and do so from an IRO perspective and explain uh, in detail those uh, new features. Uh, then we will also have uh, a bit more technical overview of the next OLA updates. Um, and what will also follow is not just the features that you'll see already in autumn, but we will discuss a bit more on what else is in the pipeline. Um, then we will also talk about the transition to the next program, but as Elena nicely highlighted, indeed more details will be coming later. So we will just touch upon it and um, you can expect uh, more detailed information uh, at the start of the next academic year. Last but not least, there is also the questions and answers session um, at, the end of the, at the end of the webinar, approximately 20 minutes. And the same way as last time, we will also be using the Slido room. So we do invite you to already go there and uh, use the option to, um, to share your questions as well as upload them. And uh, you can do so by using the event code OLA underscore updated. You can see it here at the, at the bottom of the slide. So OLA underscore updated. And uh, so yeah, similarly as the last time, we'll go through them. And again, I wanted to highlight that we'll, uh, we'll do our best also to, to summarize and, and make sure that uh, the information is available to you after that. So, but, um, so in short, we will today uh, present the upcoming updates. And oh, just uh, sorry, going to the next slide. Yes. And um, but what is very, very important for us to highlight and is that basically the updates are rooted in the feedback that we have received from you. And I know that many of you must have seen the slides on the history of OLA projects and maybe even more than once. But we do think it's a very key fact and these four years of experience does offer a lot of insights and a lot of ideas on how to move forward and really how to also bring the whole process to a new level and therefore uh, at the end of the last OLA project we carried out a survey um, and we did so among the higher education institutions as well as the students and the idea was to collect their feedback and above all also assess the fitness for purpose for OLA and the dashboard. The survey was sent out at the end of 2019 and we received more than 2,500 responses from the students and more than 1,000 answers from the IROs. Um, extensive analysis was carried out from this material and I'm also very happy to announce that it's also freshly published and accessible for you now. It, you can find, you'll be able to find it also in the Rasmus Europe Paper Competence Center, but 
as of now, it's already on the uh, resources section inside of the uh, UF website. We'll also make an article so that it's easy for you to immediately find it. Um, but the material is already available. And um, I will just touch upon some of the key findings that uh, we had in this, uh, we, that we found out from this, uh, this survey. And uh, the key fact for us there was, um, it was really a pleasure to see the high satisfaction rate among students with the OLA. And as you can see here, it's above 90% of the students that are saying that they would recommend the platform to other peers. And it's really has been really a warning experience to see how this number is going up and up as we tweaked the platform since its launch already more than four years ago. So all in all, it is great to see that most students do see online learning agreement as a very natural way of handling their documentations. And above, in addition to that, what I also wanted to highlight there, it's, um, it was a very interesting fact to see that when we asked a um, similar question to the IROs, uh, to estimate uh, the student satisfaction with the tool, um, they really underestimate how happy students actually are. Um, next to that, what you also see here in the slide is that um, basically 93% of the IROs do think that learning agreements should be managed online via a simple to use tool. And so all in all, we are on the right path. But of course, things can obviously get better. Um, and it's also because um, the main finding, one of the main findings that we had at the Erasmus Center Paper Desk Research back in 2015, was that the vast majority of the IROs still see the um, workload that is surrounding the uh, Erasmus Mobility's management as either high or very high. And unfortunately, we saw here that it's still the case, and it's a very significant share of colleagues that, that basically said that they are drowning in work. And we really do hope that this will start to change as the digitization comes into play on its own, and rather than just being something of an afterthought. And um, also, in line with this workload issue, what we also saw was among the IROs who have already officially introduced the, the learning agreement, the online learning agreement in their workflows as a tool for managing the Erasmus mobilities, the key reason why they did so was to decrease the workload. That was, uh, that was said by 87% of them. It was also followed by curiosity by almost 50%. And when we combine this, the wish to decrease the workload, as well as the curiosity, what we have ended up now with is more than 2,000 of higher education institutions have already requested access to the Erasmus dashboard account. And on top of that, there are another 5,000 additional staff accounts that also have access to the system. And yet we are fully aware there is room for improvement. And with regards to the dashboard, we saw that it was 76% of the IRO staff that said that they would recommend the usage to the, another part, to the other partners. And um, this discrepancy that we see in the level of satisfaction between the online learning agreement for students and the dashboard for IROs, it is something that we did anticipate. Given the fact the dashboard was launched much later than the online learning agreement, and it has also undergone only one development cycle. And still, we, we do think it's a pretty good outcome, essentially from something that is a deliverable of key action to strategic partnership. And, um, but all in all, from this survey, um, the most important thing that we were looking for was the areas of improvement. And that was really also the starting point of the Online Learning Agreement 3 project. In addition to these survey outcomes that we had, we also had a very knowledgeable consortium. And the vast experience in this team with working with online learning agreements, as well as the Erasmus Zero Paper Network. And also having not just the institutions and the universities as partners, but also student representatives that were, uh, that were uh, represented by the ESN. And um, next to this experience. Hello, Blanca, just for a second. Um, yes. Do you want to switch your camera on? Um, Yes, there's always something that um, we, I.
Lodaika, you've muted yourself. Yes, okay. now, now you should be able to see me and also see you in live and in color. Okay, yes, in color okay. as well. Perfect. So, um, so what are then the, the areas of improvement? And um, I will just take off the, the participants list that, so that you see all of the slides. So, and um, the areas of improvement. Um, before that, what I really wanted to highlight is really thanking you all for the feedback because um, highlighting these numbers of how many, um, how many staff members and how many IROs already have access to the platform. We really received a tsunami of feedback from the community and it has been a fantastic pool of ideas and, and suggestions. And I also have to admit that analysis of that has been quite a challenge because very often it's also the case that what we see is also contradictory feedback. But nevertheless, um, it's definitely a very enriching challenge to make sure that um, we can uh, distill the right approach of how we can really move forward. And so um, having this as a, as a, as a cornerstone for, um, for moving forward, um, it was also the, the discussions with the, that we had with the students, with the national agencies, with the higher education institutions and the commission, and making sure that the online learning agreement can really fulfill its purpose, that it's a document that offers transparency and it also safeguards the recognition processes. And if we are then going down to business and uh, focusing in more detail than what were the areas that we were uh, dealing with. The first one was really the rigidity in the process. And as one of the open answers to the survey uh, very expressively illustrated this was the rigidity in the process. And um, the way it was described is that the biggest issue with the dashboard is that it does not forgive mistakes. And what I wanted to comment on here is that the, the issue that causes headaches here is actually twofold. And the first issue is that we need to have uh, the up-to-date information on the coordinators and the staff members who are really dealing with the learning agreements. As very often what happens is that it's neither the staff at the institution nor the students that can know who is the right colleague who needs to be contacted. And what happens is that um, it's really very time consuming to track down the right contact point. And what it creates in process is another avalanche of emails to already very, very full inboxes. So, and the second aspect that uh, you also see here in the slide is um, the, um, the fact that it's necessary to make sure that there are no dead ends in the process. And um, the, the way how uh, the online learning agreements are finalized are not interrupted. Because unfortunately, it was still a substantial share of learning agreements that were never finalized in the digital form, just because the systems were uh, not compatible or the institutions, for some reason, still reverted to the paper version. And another aspect or another um, well, side of the rigidity argument um, is also the fact that oftentimes there is need to correct very basic personal information and, and just typos. And currently it's something that is rather time consuming and actually requires some back and forth. And therefore more control over the process is indeed necessary for the institutions when initiating the learning agreements as well as throughout the whole process to make sure that the data is entered correctly, no duplicate learning agreements are initiated and there's also chance to correct those mistakes if need be. Um, another aspect was the signing solution and um, the current approach with the, touch, with the need for the touchpad, it was indeed seen as um, not necessarily the best option for everyone. Um, even after almost 80,000 of learning agreements that have been created without issues with the audit procedures, it's still seen as maybe not the most comfortable approach. And therefore, given that there are advancements in technology that could allow for more simplification and more also accessible solution, that was something that we also worked on. And with all of this in mind, and um, of course, also more ideas that, uh, that we gathered from uh, the whole uh, analysis process. We were basically thinking how to translate these issues into the actual features of 
how, basically that allow the, uh, to support the institutions and, and the students better. And here I would then give the floor to my colleague Nikos from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. And he will elaborate more on how um, indeed these potential issues could be translated uh, into, into actual features. And I saw uh, in the chat box, there was one, uh, one question on the, uh, the Slido code. I just wanted to remind it, it's OLA and underscore updated. So then I will stop sharing my screen and give the floor to Nikos. Okay, Nikos, you have the presenter role and your microphone's live now. Okay, thanks a lot. Hello to everybody. I hope you, you can hear, hear me. Um, many greetings to all the participants at this uh, webinar. So, um, my part here is to uh, present the International Relations Office's uh, viewpoint uh, for the online learning agreement, the updated online learning agreement. Uh, I'm representing the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, who is a proud partner of the project the Online Learning Agreement 3. Um, and uh, uh, there are some issues, of course, how, how making online learning agreement work in uh, the uh, international relations offices. So, um, uh, you know that um, uh, the online learning agreement has to uh, balance between three uh, different uh, uh, parts, to, to different, three different pillars. Uh, that is the needs of the students, uh, the needs of the higher education institutions, of course, the needs of the Erasmus Plus program, uh, where we are all bound to and we have to uh, follow certain guidelines. So um, the, the key reasoning behind the, the new updates was to empower uh, the international relations offices uh, and to, to make sure that they are up-to-date uh, uh, data and functionalities in order to uh, operate with. The first issue, the first point that we all have to uh, deal with when we uh, dealing with uh, our uh, students' uh, on, online learning agreements, it's uh, that uh, uh, we do not have, perhaps, we did not have uh, until now, uh, uh, the desired control over the contact uh, data. Uh, so, uh, the new uh, functionality is that uh, uh, there will be an updated contact list, and so uh, we are, will put this information uh, on the, at the fingertips, uh, in a way, uh, quite literally, of the students by making this uh, choice uh, simpler and straightforward, uh, meaning uh, that they do not have to guess who the coordinator is. You saw the slide that I got, uh, previously showed to all of us. Um, and uh, so uh, the issue was that uh, usually the students had to guess and to, uh, had to go through the websites and to receive mails about the, uh, the contacts, uh, the contact person and the responsible person at this university. So now uh, the, we, we can, uh, in the dashboard, there's international relations offices, uh, insert and uh, create accounts for the contact persons uh, per, per higher education or uh, even per faculty. Uh, so when the student goes in the, the app, in the online learning agreement app, so they can uh, select directly the right uh, contract uh, contact sorry from a drop-down list uh, or otherwise you can uh, by default uh, set the contact person and so the uh, contact uh, details uh, will be uh, included uh, automatically in the online learning agreement of the student uh, remember here you have to yeah yeah hello, it's um it's graham here just one thing to check um are you are you presenting slides at the moment? Because yeah. we're not seeing them. No, sorry. Sorry again, just I, I was under the impression that uh, I was sharing my desktop, sorry. Uh, so, share desktop, okay. Okay, now I think it's better. I apologize. Uh, so, So everything's okay now. Uh, it's it's okay now. Yes. Okay. Th th thanks a lot, Graham. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I haven't used Webex <laughs> so so often, so I, I was lost here. So this is the, the three pillars I mentioned before, and so this is the the point I was elaborating on uh, regarding the control over the contact data of uh, of the students of uh, 
the, uh, the responsible persons and contact persons in higher education. So just a, a quick review, there will be an updated contact list uh, uh, based on our uh, input from the international relations offices. And so the students will have contact persons per higher education institution or the faculty. The students then can have the option, will have the option to select uh, the right contact person from a drop down list. So they will just select one, uh, one contact. And so this means that uh, uh, there will be more, um, less, sorry, errors uh, and uh, uh, no typing, no searching in the websites and no uh, perhaps contacting via email uh, in order to find the, uh, the right uh, coordinator. The, the other option is, of course, uh, that, uh, as I told you, to set default contacts, uh, which will be uh, automatically uh, filled in in the, uh, in the learning agreement of the student. Uh, another issue that was mentioned before was the duplicates of the online learning agreement. You know here that, uh, as Daiga mentioned, the uh, online learning agreement, unfortunately, until now, did not uh, forgive any mistakes. Uh, and so uh, when one uh, learning agreement was uh, not properly filled in, then uh, the student in the, the international relations office had the Rasmus office had to decline the learning agreement. And so it had to be filled in again. So uh, the, the, the approach here was to make sure, first of all, that uh, uh, we can identify students, that all uh, users of the online learning agreement are students, not uh, third party, uh, perhaps uh, persons. Uh, and that we could also have uh, some uh, higher education institution specific settings that the uh, student would have uh, could have access to, and of course make it sure that students has only one uh, online learning agreement. So uh, this approach led to, uh, of course, um, uh, to using it identification and authentication of the student through the European Student Identifier uh, in order to uh, identify that this is a student. And of course, uh, to have access uh, to uh, the online online learning agreement system that each higher education institution uh, uses, uh, the authentication uh, requirements and um, background of all this uh, work has been done through my academic ID project. So anyone who wants to see how this could be uh, implemented uh, within their systems uh, should go to the website uh, of the um, the homepage of the project or uh, attend the first uh, uh, webinar that uh, uh, ESI was uh, elaborated there. Uh, and of course, another very uh, useful functionality is that once we authenticate the student, then we can uh, choose to turn off a self-service uh, function. And so the student cannot initiate his or her own, her own uh, online learning agreement. And we are the only ones that will initiate it and um, uh, go forward with the, uh, the procedure. The next issue also was the third, perhaps, was the rigidity uh, issue about uh, to have more control uh, over uh, the changes and uh, the updates that uh, are done through the online learning agreement. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, having an overview of all the changes was a tricky uh, challenge. Uh, so uh, there was there is a need uh, for a process uh, that will be uh, detailed, uh, but informative also, and uh, we capture the key changes. We all know, uh, we all work in the international relations offices, and we know that almost 70% of uh, students uh, use uh, the changes to online learning, to the learning agreement. So, although it's an exceptional uh, document, it's used by uh, almost 70% of the students. Uh, in this way, uh, and in order to uh, have a better uh, overview, um, uh, the new, uh, the updated uh, online learning agreement will introduce a versioning function, uh, meaning that we will uh, have the uh, ability to track changes in the learning agreement. So the agreement will not be uh, abolished altogether, will not be declined altogether, but every change that will be made will be a new version of the learning agreement. And uh, in this way, we will also have a very, um, uh, you know, uh, a very, uh, a very detailed history of uh, this document, of the process of the document and the blur, the border between uh, before and during mobility documents uh, will be in a way blurred. Uh, perhaps it will be more easy for us uh, because we, have, we will have the history of the document. Uh, also, uh, when we have a typo or uh, some kind of other mistake in the document, it will not be in this, uh, uh, that we, the document will have to be declined. 
uh, but uh, that it will be a more transparent uh, process um, where we can see the changes and in introduce changes as well. Uh, of course, this uh, has to do with uh, the personal data or the data of the university, uh, host and receiving uh, university. Uh, when we come to the tables, uh, the courses is the core part of the learning agreement, so any change uh, in the learning agreement uh, in, in terms of courses and, uh, and modules and all these kind of things uh, should also trigger a new uh, uh, validation procedure, a new signing of the document. Uh, and of course, all this uh, procedure will give more clarity uh, for audit uh, procedures uh, and uh, requirements. The updated online learning agreement also had in mind uh, not to, uh, to have no dead ends uh, in this uh, um, in this process, and so to have an uninterrupted process uh, in management of the online learning agreements. This was uh, uh, accomplished through the uh, connection with the uh, rather without paper. So there are uh, the interoperability standards that are being followed. So uh, from uh, uh, 2021, uh, international relations offices and universities uh, will be uh, will be possible, will be able to uh, to, to connect through the Rasmus without paper, and so uh, connect their own their own, own, own systems, uh, learning agreement systems, perhaps with the online learning agreement, and so the negotiations will be more uh, smooth, uh, and uh, uh, there will be, of course, uh, as I told you before, an, an interrupted process respectively uh, whether you are using uh, an in-house or a third-party uh, solution for managing learning agreements. Uh, last but not least is the same signing, uh, the signatures uh, in the document. Uh, now signing in the digital area has changed a lot uh, and uh, uh, as also Daiga mentioned, uh, there is an issue with the touchpad, uh, so uh, we need to know who is the uh, signee of the document and we need the most we need the most robust authentication of the signee. Uh, so uh, this authentication we uh, said before uh, through uh, my academic ID project and the EduGain uh, will uh, give us the possibility to have a more uh, robust authentication process. And of course, uh, due to the new um, possibilities and new um, uh, capabilities, let's say, of the, the digital area and the infrastructure we have. We can move to uh, a validation of the documents and not a signing per se, as we are all used to until now. So the uh, updated online learning agreement will have this uh, uh, opportunity, this possibility, and this functionality um, uh, to uh, click and validate uh, the uh, online learning agreement. So uh, the result of all these things for uh, an international relations office, the Erasmus office, uh, will be to have a more streamlined process. So in this uh, flowchart uh, we have prepared, you can see uh, how the current online learning agreement works and how the updated online learning agreement works. Uh, so uh, let me uh, say, for example, that sorry, um, if you see the current uh, uh, learning agreement is here, and uh, when we go through this process, uh, we do not have an idea of the student, and so these uh, results duplicates of. Uh, online learning agreements, uh, or uh, when we go uh, also through uh, initiation of the learning agreement, uh, the student search of the uh, responsible person, so we have a, a bunch of typos and mistakes, the, uh, relation, the national relations office has to decline, and the student starts a new learning agreement, we have new duplicates, uh, if you have, we have new typos, we go back, so we have a, a rather messy, perhaps, in, in this case, uh, uh, situation. Uh, but when we go to the uh, uh, updated online learning agreement, uh, then uh, this situation and the procedure is more streamlined. We have uh, an identification of the students, so we have no dupl duplicates. We have an easy choice of uh, the drop from the drop-down list from the, for the contact persons uh, and responsible persons. And so uh, we have the versioning, so uh, we have uh, left behind our um, constant changes and new uh, documents and new uh, learning agreements. And the last uh, um, step is, of course, the, the signature and the validation, which uh, from the signature we have uh, uh, switched to the validation uh, of the online learning agreement. I hope it's useful. Perhaps it gives an overview of the whole process. Um, 
Another uh, new uh, functionality that is not uh, in production yet, but will come, and so it's just a, a, sneak, peek, a sneak preview of uh, what has to come, is that uh, there is also um, uh, uh, the, the, the functionality of having all the online learning agreements in one place. So online learning agreements for trainships will, all go, will be also uh, included in the dashboard. It, they are not yet. But they will follow. So just have, uh, have in mind uh, that uh, uh, you uh, will also see this functionality uh, in the coming months, perhaps, uh, and you will be notified about about this. So um, the last slide on my part is that uh, we are all waiting for the updated online learning agreement to be launched. This will be uh, will happen in early autumn 2020. So um, our tip is that uh, you should uh, work uh, uh, proactively. And uh, so, uh, communicate all this information to your um, administration, to higher levels, all your departmental coordinators, uh, perhaps, who will deal uh, with the online learning agreements of the students. So, to uh, make all the preparations uh, for the updated online learning agreement, uh, both for those that you use it already and those that uh, you will be obliged, according to the timeline of the European Commission, to use the online learning agreement. Uh, from 2021. Uh, this is uh, all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. And I uh, now think uh, we will give the floor to uh, Costas uh, from our university as well uh, and the IT team to present uh, the technical part of the updated online learning agreement. Okay, Costas, yep, you're live now. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, is, uh, Graham, is my camera on? Not yet. Okay. Um, that's it, you're on. Okay, the presentation is visible, right? I'm good to go. Uh, yes, you're okay, good to go. Th thank you. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Konstantinos Karaoglanoglu. I'm from the IT Center uh, of Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Uh, and I am a um, member of the team uh, that's um, developing the updated uh, OLA application and will hopefully deliver to you and your students a better uh, online uh, learning agreement tool. Um, I would like to start um, uh, by um, uh, sharing with you some um, uh, points about the current OLA application, uh, the one that is in production mode right now. Um, we uh, started um, the, the first action we, uh, we did take when we took over uh, as a development team uh, for the development of the new OLA uh, was to uh, basically enhance the current web application with uh, better monitoring tools uh, and we did this uh, in order to identify uh, bottlenecks and maybe performance issues that we corrected them now we sp we spent uh, some time in um, improving uh, bottlenecks and the performance of the current application uh, I <laughs> I'm already seeing in the chat that I that I um, I'm getting already too technical, right? Okay, <laughs> I'll try to be not too technical mm. and um, basically stabilizing the current uh, web application allowed us to to focus uh, on the development of the updated to LA in a in a stress-free way. Stress-free way. Also, um, the the improvement actions that we did take in the current uh, OLA application um, will also ensure a smooth rollout of the updated OLA. Now, um, 
Regarding the updated OLA web application, um, a, a major improvement that we introduced is that the application is uh, developed uh, 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 based on a framework, and the framework is uh, Drupal 8. We have taken a mobile-first approach, meaning that um, uh, when developing, uh, we gave extra attention um, uh, so that the, uh, the updated web application uh, will be efficient on both types of devices, desktop and mobile. mobile. Uh, we try to adhere to the uh, best practices in terms of UI UX. The updated OLA will offer an easy to use administration area. Um, it will be GDPR compliant. And another uh, major um, uh, improvement that uh, we introduced is that uh, the new, the updated OLA application um, has a built-in JSON API for uh, interoperability issues. Interoperability is when um, uh, applications need to communicate with each other, which is um, the point in uh, the updated OLA. I would like to say some things first uh, about the, the learning agreement as an entity in the framework-based uh, web application. And not much change here. I mean, in the current OLA application, the LA is displayed as <laughs> display uh, the LA is displayed as a multi-step form, and this is the case for the new um, for the for the updated uh, OLA application. Now, um, a new functionality that is uh, that is uh, introduced here is about the transcript of records functionality, which is already attached in the updated OLA application, and uh, the the updated OLA that it is about to launch. Uh, in autumn of 2020, is able to receive TOR data and display them back to the students. Okay, TOR data is the transcript of records, the, the grades after the mobility is uh, completed. Um, a major um, improvement is that uh, we have uh, added versioning or uh, the, the more correct term is revisioning of uh, the learning agreements that are stored in the application. We took a greedy revisioning approach that um, uh, this means that each and every change in the components of the learning agreement triggers a new version that it is stored in the application. It is basically a functionality that uh, uh, keeps and stores in the application uh, versions of the learning agreement as time progresses and users update the agreement. Now, the advantage from uh, revisioning and versioning the LAs is uh, that uh, we'll have a, a full history log available to the administrator and maybe to the user, to the student. And uh, this uh, versioning approach allows us um, to perform diff actions between versions of the same learning agreement. And this is also a feature that could come handy um, in uh, the future. In the updated OLA application, the, the primary way uh, for a user to log in is, um, is the My Academic ID one. Uh, we have developed an, um, an OpenID Connect client to enable users logging in, conforming with the My Academic ID specs. Now, um, in order to, to facilitate a smoother transition and for a short period of time, uh, we'll also offer to the users the ability to log in via Google accounts until um, all users are ready to to use uh, the My Academic ID compliant solution. Um, taking a look at the taking a look at the uh, current uh, OLA application and the updated 
OLA application. Um, we've uh, performed some uh, UI UX um, improvements. I think that um, the example uh, that I've screencasted will help you understand better what I mean. Uh, the current OLA application has a, a glitchy UI UX way when fetching data from external sources and displaying them uh, back to the user. So uh, we are uh, uh, making uh, UI UX improvements um, in, uh, in all necessary uh, points in order to ensure a better experience for the user. Now, this is a video I've, I've screencasted that shows the current OLA application and the user trying to um, fill out info about uh, the sending institution. So, as you see, he first has to select the country and then there is a, a large list of institutions in, um, uh, in a new tab uh, so that the user can select the, the one. I mean, uh, this is not a best practice of UI UX. In the uh, updated OLA application, we've made the sanitization and all these fields that fetch data from external sources are displayed as um, uh, autocomplete uh, drop-down fields. This is a screencast from the draft form of the LA in the updated OLA application. When the user focuses on the country field, there is a select list with all the countries. He can type in the field also, and then if he selects the country from the drop down or types it, then um, another autocomplete uh, drop down uh, field uh, with uh, with all the available um, uh, institutions uh, is also very easy to use. So wh wherever we found uh, uh, this kind of UI UX uh, UX uh, glitches, we try to. Uh, to develop a more efficient way for the user to interact uh, with a tool. This is indeed a, um, a much technical uh, slide, but um, uh, I cannot just uh, skip it uh, because it is very, very important in the in the uh, updated OLA application. Um, all functionality available to the user. Uh, in the updated OLA web application is also openly available through a JSON API to select the Erasmus ecosystem applications. Therefore, this uh, JSON API and the documentation of the API is what helps us to achieve a high level of interoperability when applications need to communicate with, uh, with each other. It's really... Yeah, it's technical, but it's very important when developing um, new applications or when you try to update functionalities of existing applications that the updated OLA web application um, has a built-in JSON API that is thoroughly documented and basically an application can communicate with the OLA application through this API very easily. Uh, yes, the JSON API is totally documented in a standard that's called Open API 3, and it can be easily utilized by other development teams. Regarding uh, the OLA and dashboard uh, integration in the EWP uh, network, we have uh, already done um, a lot of work um, in uh, connecting the current OLA web application in the EWP, in the EWP network, and we have managed to publish data from the current um, OLA um, in the EWP network, and we are using all this experience in order to fully connect the updated OLA in the EWP network. Um, this is um, the blockchain feasibility study is not really a development task, but um, it is um, uh, work that we have done in the past few months. Uh, uh, a great colleague of ours uh, conducted this feasibility study, Yorgos Vlahavas, and he will um, uh, he will present to you the results 
shortly after me. Um, I won't uh, say much about this. Um, this is a um, somewhat uh, research work uh, that discusses the possibility of whether and how blockchain technologies could be incorporated in the updated uh, OLA. Uh, my, my, my colleague uh, Yorgos will have more to say about this in, in, uh, uh, shortly after me. So, I've taken some time to um, present uh, some bottlenecks and um, issues on the current OLA. What we have done uh, the past few months uh, uh, in developing the updated uh, OLA. And uh, before closing my presentation, I would like to um, to, to give you a, a brief timeline of things to come uh, uh, in the future. Give me a, a moment to refresh. No. Yes. Indeed, uh, we as a development team of the OLA web application, uh, we have an exciting summer ahead of us. Uh, we are already working in improving the look and feel of the web application, uh, the theming of the application, uh, adhering to the best practices of UI, UX, and making sure that the application is um, efficient uh, on both desktop and mobile devices. And the other uh, issue, the other development issues that uh, we will be working on is um, the, the OLA and Erasmus dashboard interoperability tasks, because these two applications need to communicate um, um, extremely well, efficiently, and effective uh, in order for the whole flow to, to work. So from now um, till uh, mid-August, uh, we definitely have further development work to do. Now, when um, the development work is done, uh, we'll have um, a major testing phase. We'll have application testing conducting, uh, conducted through scripts and scenarios in order to enhance the overall quality of the web application that we are going to deliver to you. And uh, around mid to late September, uh, we will go live with the updated uh, OLA app uh, ready to satisfy uh, student requests. So, thank you very much for the attention. I hope that the presentation was not too technical. And uh, I, would like, I would like to introduce uh, to you our colleague, uh, uh, Yorgos Vlachavas, that um, uh, has conducted the blockchain feasibility study. Um, it will be definitely be interesting um, to you because this technology is new and uh, he, he tried to, to nicely uh, couple it with, uh, with uh, the OLA application and entities in the updated uh, web application. So thank you. Thank you for the attention. Hi everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, Yorgos, I can hear you. Okay, uh, I'm afraid I cannot share it, my screen, Greg. Yeah, because uh, I don't think we solved that issue. So, Costas, can you share the slides on your screen, and I'll, I will be telling you when to move forward. Um, would you like to try to share now? I was sharing uh, my desktop. Costas. Yes. Costas, it's Graham here. Um, well, we have a connection problem with George, so we need to go to Plan B. Um, can you share his, but can you do it with a local copy, not via the web? Yes, okay. Um, give me one minute. Sure. Uh, George, do you want to introduce yourself and yeah. uh, get ready? Is yeah. your video, can you switch your video on as well? Um, sorry, I don't have a camera either. <laughs> uh, okay, fine. No problem. So you will have to use only the slides. Okay. <sighs> Okay, so I'm, uh, my name is George Vlahavas. I am a researcher with the uh, Data and Web Science Laboratory 
of the computer science department in uh, the in the Aristotle University of Saloniki. Uh, my specialization is on blockchain technologies. I'm um, here to talk to you about the uh, blockchain feasibility study we conducted for the uh, online learning agreement project. Uh, yeah, we're waiting for uh, Costas to uh, show the slides. I'm afraid I'm not able to do it due to a technical problem. So, uh, wait just a bit. Yeah, okay. We can move on to, to the second slide now. Okay, uh, so I'm guessing that many of you might not be aware of what a blockchain is. So I'm going to do a high level introduction to the concept first. Uh, basically, blockchain is just what its name suggests. It's a, it's a chain of blocks. We start by generating the first ever block. This is called uh, the Genesis block. Um, I'll try not to get too technical, yeah. Uh, and then we keep adding blocks one after another. Uh, usually at somewhat specific time intervals. So it's a data structure that is always expanding. You, cannot, you can only add to it. Uh, due to the way it is structured, uh, it's not possible to remove or change in any way any of the previous blocks in the chain. Because simply put, that would break the chain. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, I don't want to go into much technical detail here, uh, but the way it works is that each block that is generated, it, it includes a direct link to the previous block in the chain by including a unique number that identifies that previous block. Uh, in order to create one new block, the entire network of connected computers across the world uh, needs to spend huge amounts of processing power. You might have heard that the electricity consumption of the Bitcoin network, uh, for example, resembles that of a small country. This is true for all public blockchains. Uh, this is also what makes it practically impossible to remove or change any of the previous blocks in any way. You would need to spend even more power than that uh, that has already been spent. Uh, however, the calculations that are required to verify that everything is correct uh, are trivial. So new blocks are hard to produce, but easy to verify. Uh, now, every single computer that is connected to the blockchain network keeps a copy of the entire blockchain. So if I write something on the blockchain, everybody receives it on their hard drives. Uh, now, blockchain systems were initially created uh, for sending di digital money. It all started with Bitcoin, but blockchains have evolved and you can do much more than that now. The most interesting thing uh, for us would be that someone can store any kind of data on the blockchain, um, including online learning agreement data. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I would say that the most important characteristic of a blockchain is that data that is written on it is practically immutable. That means that it cannot be changed and cannot be deleted. You can think of a blockchain as a book where, where you can only add new pages, but you're not allowed to remove or edit previous pages. Another one, as I've said, is that all data is replicated everywhere, so it's really impossible to lose data. Another thing is that blockchains enable the interaction of different parties with no intermediates. You don't have to trust anyone. For example, if I want to send money to someone through my, through my bank, I'll have to trust my bank or PayPal or whatever I use. Uh, but with a blockchain, I don't have to trust anyone at all. I just trust the system that it works and indeed it does. Um, Another thing to consider is that uh, we have smart contracts. Uh, these are an, um, essentially computer code that runs on the blockchain and it, it allows us to automate processes. Uh, again, without having to trust anyone. Code that runs on the blockchain is virtually unstoppable. You cannot simply unplug a few computers to, to, to do that. You'll have to remove every single computer from the blockchain network and that is impossible. Next slide, please. 
So uh, to move forward, we also have to consider the two major categories of blockchain technologies, pl public and private blockchains. Uh, public blockchains, uh, such as Bitcoin, is what started everything. Anyone can connect to them. Uh, there's no identity requirement and everyone can see and validate everything that is written on the blockchain. Uh, private blockchains, on the other hand, have been mainly targeted, have been created targeting uh, enterprise use. One, we have to be allowed to participate in the network, which means that everyone needs to have an identity. Um, due to the enterprise setting, there is also no transparency. That means that uh, not anyone can see all data, only what they're allowed to see. Next slide, please. Okay, so what can a blockchain do for the online learning agreement? Uh, it would certainly force everyone to have uh, better in uh, interoperable systems. So everyone we would be able to work with each other easier. Uh, a unified authentication system across all institutions will also be possible. Uh, so for example, a student uh, in, uh, that moves to another university for a semester would just be able to use their account from their originating university for as long as they're there. Uh, is it really too technical already? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, identities and capabilities would be strictly determined and everything recorded on the blockchain could be verified by anyone that has an interest in doing so. And of course, security and uh, robustness would be improved since this would be inherited by the uh, blockchain architecture. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so how can we determine if a process is suitable for adopting blockchain technology? You may find similar flowcharts like this one online. There's some probably a bit more involved. Uh, the first question to ask is whether your process needs a place to store data. If it does, then it only makes sense to use a blockchain. If multiple people are, are required to write to that, to that data store. Uh, with both of these questions for the online agreement, uh, the answer is probably yes. Okay, so since one of the main uh, characteristics of blockchains is that they uh, create a trustless environment, we'll have to ask if users trust each other. If we consider institutions as the only users of the system, then the answer I think would probably be yes. But if you also consider students, then I think that the answer is probably no. Finally, we'll have to consider if there's someone in the system that everyone else can trust. Perhaps the EWP can play a role here, uh, but it has to be decided. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so if it is decided that the blockchain solution is finally going to be adopted, how would it work? Um, what we're proposing, our main proposal, is uh, that the architecture could be based on a hyperledger fabric blockchain, that is a private blockchain. That essentially means that all data stores across all institutions would be replaced with a blockchain, with uh, strict identity management and access control, of course. Uh, for this to work, every participating institution would need to host at least one node, that is, one computer connected to the blockchain network. For institutions that are not able to do so, um, for any reason, perhaps the EWP could provide the necessary infrastructure for them. Uh, okay, I'll try. From a technical standpoint, uh, this would probably be the best solution. Um, I mean, the uh, Hyperledger Fabric uh, solution. But uh, we have to realize that uh, it would require considerable infrastructure changes across all institutions. That is not that easy to coordinate, I think. Next slide, please. Okay, um, maybe this would... Uh, provide some explanation of, what, uh, of how a Hyperledger Fabric uh, network would work. Um, okay, so in this solution, uh, we could have an example network like this one. Uh, there may be different institutions, different colors for every institution here. Um, and each one 
would be able to host blockchain nodes. And uh, if they already have an authentication service in place, they can re reuse that for the blockchain network. Uh, such examples would be institution one, two, and three. Uh, the top, the three top ones uh, in this figure. So um, institutions could run their own blockchain nodes and have al already existing authentication services which the blockchain network can connect with. Um, there may be other institutions like uh, Institute 4 in the yellow color that uh, may not be able to host uh, blockchain nodes on their premises. But they may have already an authentication service. That's okay. They can use that to connect to the uh, blockchain network. And uh, the EWP would be able to provide nodes for that purpose. Computers that host the actual data, that is. Uh, there could also be other institutions, like uh, Institute 5, that do not have capability of running any nodes or do not have any authentication service in place. There could be a centralized authentication service hosted by the EWP uh, to solve this issue as well. Um, for a more detailed description of the architecture, I'm afraid I will have to point you to the respective report uh, as it gets too technical after this point. Uh, next slide, please, please, Costas. Okay. So, uh, in addition to the previous solution, uh, we can also propose an alternative one. This time based on a public blockchain, uh, such as Bitcoin or Ethereum. The greatest advantage of this is that there is absolutely no need for any additional infrastructure. It can all be handled by the existing blockchain network. Of course, any institution that uh, wants to add a node to uh, the existing blockchain networks can do so, but it's not an absolute requir requirement. Uh, in this uh, solution, we don't store all data on the blockchain, as we did with the previous one, uh, because that would be too expensive. Every uh, piece of data that we store on the blockchain costs real money. We only store transaction hashes with this solution. Uh, this would support the validation of data that is stored on existing data stores. And, that, and in this way, we, we, we would make sure that this data that is stored on the databases of each institution is never, never altered. The downside of the solution is that this way of operation is not exactly how institutions are generally used to operate. It would, it would be required to spend a small amount of money in the form of Bitcoin or most likely Ether, some cryptocurrency, uh, with every transaction we make, every time that data is written on the blockchain. Um, this includes complications, uh, such as that institutions would need to uh, exchange euros with cryptocurrencies at some point. Again, a more detailed description of this is available in the uh, respective report. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so with both solutions, on a technical level, blockchains are capable of supporting the online learning agreement. There is no technical reason at all that uh, would stop the adoption of a blockchain system, whatever the blockchain system may be. However, um, before going forward, we need to also look into the GDPR. The GDPR includes terms that state that users should be able to request deletion of their data. Uh, if this data is stored on the blockchain, that would be, be technically impossible. There are some, uh, there are some exceptions, though, uh, stated in the GDPR that uh, state that you may not need to do that. But it needs to be carefully examined, I mean the GDPR, uh, to make sure that it allows for adopting our first proposed solution. Uh, yeah, the alternative solution, though, uh, only stores hashes, so there is no issue with the GDPR 
whatever. Okay, so in order to go forward with a blockchain solution, you would, we would have to do a more in-depth te technical study uh, and discuss the needs of every institution individually and how they could all be coordinated towards a unified blockchain solution. Thank you. Um, so, um, it's Daika here again, and uh, the first thing that I wanted to say, it's, uh, it's indeed a privilege to work together with the team from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, and we're really excited with the, um, to see the knowledge and to see also the, the spirit of exploration and, and seeing what can we do actually with the latest technologies that are available and how could they contribute even more to the, to the options of, of, of further advancing the processes. and. Yes, staying always, staying always open and staying always uh, kind of yes, curious, as someone also mentioned in the in the chat, and trying to explore of what is possible and and, and could help us even more. Um, so I'm now a presenter, see, so I can share my I can share my presentation again. I will very very swiftly um, uh, share some last uh, uh, last details before we go to the questions and answers. But yes, uh, your your questions will be dealt with uh, dealt with shortly. And what I just very briefly wanted to comment on is that what we did today was basically illustrating what are the problems we have mapped, what are the needs of the IROs and the students, and how we are planning to address them. And this last section with the blockchain already illustrated that we are still thinking beyond that, and there are still aspects that are, um, are still being discussed and we are still trying to understand of what could be the best uh, approach to, to move forward with them. And I'll just mention some of the examples. And the first one is reminders functionality. And I have to say that this is something that both the institutions and also the students are very, very passionate about. And the reason for that is because there is a very group, big group of people who uh, see them as something that is not really necessary and and just this big group of people who really would like to have them and the issue there is that for some it's it's really something that overburdens already uh, very full inboxes and it's not necessary just because the process of reviewing the learning agreements just naturally takes some time so the partners and the students just need to be patient and it's it's not necessary to have this noisy interaction on top of everything that is already going on but for others, it is indeed seen as a lifeline that allows to be more in control of the process and making sure that you can do something to, to, to finalize it in case um, you think that like it, it has reached some kind of bottleneck. So we are still seeing how exactly it could work. Could it maybe be the triggered uh, after certain time frame? So for example, first two weeks, nothing would happen. Um, and, or would it be, for example, the summary of all the pending matters? Um, or maybe potentially also something um, something more noisy, but to be seen. Uh, the next aspect, Costas already mentioned that the, the transcript of records is something that is already um, well included in the basic architecture of the up, of the updated learning agreement. Uh, well, basically the design, but we are still fleshing out of how exactly the notifications would be then communicated, how and when uh, to the students and also to the institutions, the partners. Um, another aspect is the ICM, International Credit Mobility, and the non-Erasmus. And the, the thing here is, of course, we would love to use uh, the existing infrastructure and the systems that are already there and make sure that we can streamline and simplify the processes based on what is already available. And so we are further investigating of how exactly uh, the current OLA infrastructure could be utilized for something like that. So, um, but these are just some of the some of the aspects that we are still further investigating about, and there was already a lot of uh, a lot of information and a lot of announcements. But there's another one that we also want to share with you, and this is something that I'm very very sure all of you will be happy to hear about, and it's something that I also have been waiting for for quite some time. And what we want to share with you is that at the end of the summer we are planning to launch a updated ticketing system. So basically it would be uh, a help desk update and it would be servicing both the students as well as the institutions. 
And the key idea here is to make sure that we are using, well, the existing knowledge base better. And it's easier to find the information that is already out there. Of course, more materials will be added. But when you are submitting your query, that it's already possible to see what are the relevant articles, what are the relevant suggestions that help you maybe find the information immediately on the spot. So easier search for what is already there, or of course to be added. And the second option, well, the second feature basically is also better tracking of the queries that are submitted. So making sure that we can also cluster them. And for example, when they are submitted, it's also clear. It's uh, maybe elaboration on the feature to understand better how things work. Maybe it's the submission of the technical bug and, and um, well, asking technical support, or it's uh, suggestions and ideas and the feedback that you want to share with us. So both of those. Better use of the knowledge base, as well as better clustering of the, of the queries that are submitted is something that we're currently working on. So yes, stay tuned. And I'm really, I'm, I'm very excited to, to see already the work that we have done there and I'm excited that we'll be able to share that with you also shortly. But then um, we can imagine that you would be keen to, to understand and, and, and learn basically what happens next. And as our colleagues from, from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki already hinted at, um, we are very happy to let you know that if everything goes according to the plan, we are hope to release the updated features as they were described already in the late September. So basically right in time also for the spring mobilities to be included in the updated tool. And another aspect that I'm guessing you might be contemplating about now is so what, what happens now? What, what do I do have? What do I, what do I have to do now? And the very easy answer is actually not much. And we really hope that you'll be able to have a very nice summer vacations now and have a good rest. We all know it has been a very exceptional and, and, and very, very uh, different semester that we have uh, past, past us and, and behind our backs. In some cases, it's still ongoing, but still. Um, so, so yes, we hope you'll be able to have some good rest after all that has been going on. And when you're returning back from those vacations at the end of the summer, in the beginning of the next semester, uh, more information will be waiting for you and we'll be informing you more on the details. In the meantime, we do advise you to consider giving access uh, to EduGain to your students so that ensuring that they can log in with their academic credentials. And other than that, it's really um, not much that would need to be uh, need to be done from your side now. And basically, when the students will be accessing the, the online learning agreement platform, it's very simply when they go to the uh, website, online learning agreement website, from the time of the launch of the new features, they will simply be able to access the new features. And for the institutions, there will be visual identification for you telling uh, which, uh, which tool they have been using. So all in all, um, we hope you'll have some good rest and uh, we stay tuned for more information to come in the, in the autumn then. And with this, I will again go to the Slido. Um, here, is, uh, here is the hashtag in case you didn't notice it before. You can still submit your questions and, and also upload them. I'm looking at the time. So what we are going to do now, we are planning to have the around 20 minutes of the questions and answers. So I will start sharing my file. I have to share the Slido screen and going full screen. So you should be seeing the seeing the yes, the questions as they have been uploaded as of now. So um, and all of us have that have been participating in the in the presentation will potentially jump in and, and try to address them as, as well as we can. So and with the first one, um, online learning agreement is mandatory in 2021. Uh, does this mean that starting from academic year 21 22? Or should you start in the spring semester 2021? And here I would give the floor to our colleagues for, at the European Commission to, to follow up on this. Yes, thank you, Taika. This is Harpa from uh, DGA. Uh, do you hear me? 
loud and clear. Okay, great. I, I don't risk turning on my camera just to make sure that the connection is uh, clear. Uh, so yes, this is of course a, a key question. Um, the reason that we say the online learning agreement is mandatory in 2021 is because this corresponds to the new Erasmus uh, program. So essentially call 2021. And what this means is that every student that is going on a mobility with funds from uh, call 2021 and during the academic year, then in most cases, 2021 and 2022. Um, also, I think it's important to uh, stress that here we're not talking about the online learning agreement that is available in the Erasmus Without Paper dashboard. Here we're talking about an online learning agreement that is either you are using the dashboard or your uh, own online learning agreements or your third party provider um, has connected the online learning agreement uh, to the network so that you have the full interoperability between online learning agreements. Um, so, yeah, I think that that basically answers the question. Of course, uh, like my colleague Alena stressed at the beginning, uh, this is a roadmap that is a living document uh, and we are constantly evaluating and assessing feedback both from national agencies as well as higher education institutions uh, that are involved in our working groups. So, um, this is something that in the coming months we're planning um, or finalizing the planning for the transition, let's say, from the current program to the next program in all aspects. And this, of course, includes how we will make the transition from the current online learning agreements uh, to the new ones, because there might be some, for example, new fields that might need to be introduced to the system uh, to reflect the novelties of the new program that my colleague Elena mentioned uh, at the beginning of today. So, yeah, I think I hope that answers the question. Uh, so basically, as from autumn 2020, so uh, we, we are planning to finalizing this transition planning. And of course, following that, we would uh, have a, uh, sent out official communications uh, to national agencies and, and update uh, our websites. Yeah. So, yes, thank you, Harpa. And I see the, the next uh, most popular questions. And in a way, a lot of things that Harpa now touched upon already are addressing that as well. And the next question we see, when will the third party provider, providers and OLA will be connected? So that happens the moment when both sides have uh, established the connection to the Erasmus Zero Paper Network. So we would not be able to comment on the third party providers when they would be ready to do it. As Harpa highlighted, the finalization of the of the template is is now ongoing. So, it would be something that you would need to inquire them on, knowing the exact and specific timelines of of when the each each and every of those providers would be able to do the, to do so. Um, so, uh, yes, I will then remove this question. And uh, the next question: When will the stable learning agreement API be released? So. This indeed also then and follows up the, the previous two questions. Um, as long as soon as the official template is there, uh, the API can be then released, then can be updated and uh, the providers can uh, further work on the implementation. Um, so um, when will the online learning agreement for traineeships be enabled? So as of now, uh, currently we are working uh, really and focusing on mainly on the learning agreement for studies and want to wrap up and finish up this part of the puzzle basically. And then um, of course the learning online learning agreement for traineeships will be uh, will be further uh, further advanced. And as Nikos already touched upon during the presentation, um, the further improvements and, and connection with the dashboard uh, will follow. Um, so. We don't use Erasmus Dashboard OLA, but in-house third-party provider. Can we work uh, with the partners who use uh, the online learning agreement? Um, so, as highlighted uh, in the beginning, the only thing that is necessary is that both sites are connected to the Erasmus Zero Paper Network. The OLA, uh, as, as basis of, of, of whole work and, and the underlying principle, it, it is and it, it will be. So it's the question of, of the other uh, system, other platform, be it in-house or third party. So as long as, as soon as the, the, the connection is, is established, um, the, the work, uh, the work in cooperation can happen in between those systems. Um, if, uh, yeah, also uh, from my colleagues, if, if there are more comments that you would want to um, 
uh, that you want to uh, raise, then yeah, just also feel free to, to jump into in the in the conversation. Um, so the dashboard is showing all learning agreements in uh, just one big pile. Uh, it's quite inconvenient uh, not to be able to to manage the list uh, list in a, in a different fashion. Um, so when it comes to, of course, the the usability aspects, then it is. Uh, it is also the the aspects that we are working on and we are planning to planning to further advance. Um, I would also maybe invite uh, Joao if you want to comment on this on further further enhancements and, and further improvements. Uh, Joao, we don't hear you, and you might be muted if you're trying to talk. Brilliant. Good afternoon. Okay. Yes. We hear you, Joao. Brilliant. Um, so, dashboard updates. Um, that's something that will that is very much on on the horizon and in terms of what we want to do, but it's Sorry. something that is, but it's something that is not part of the scope of the LA three project. I think I'm not the only one that got unmuted. Um, so that's that's something that we don't have a timeline for, and so far that uh, we will need to secure resources to continue to work in terms of the dashboard. There will be updates made to match the new functionality of 2LA, but that stops short of a full redesign. Thanks. Um, thank you for that. Uh, as the next question I see here, um, where can we find the backlog of the upcoming features and to sign up for the beta releases to help with the testing? Um, the first thing, it's, it's very kind of you to, uh, to offer and, and, and um, also uh, it's nice to see the excitement and uh, to, to join the, to join the uh, the team and, and well, basically kind of participate in the further development in a, um, well, in a deeper level. Um, we are at the moment working on, on, on quite a, quite intensive, uh, and quite a tight schedule. And as cost has already highlighted, uh, the testing well, internally, we will, we will do it, uh, at the end of, uh, starting from mid of August. Um, but it's might be too tight schedule to to well include uh, the bigger uh, testing group and also what we want to really uh, stress here that the updates that are made they are made on already um, stable and uh, platform that has um, that has functions since since years so when it comes to this testing phase um, it's not it's we are not planning to have it as um, as a time as extensive and as um, as in depth so to say um, and when it comes to backlog of the upcoming features, um, so after this presentation um, and after the webinar, we will post um, the recording itself, the slides, and also the um, kind of summary of the questions that we are having here to make sure that the information is in a written form and, and it's easier to follow. And um, it's also the Rasmus Euro Paper Competence Center, where we will update the information on what is coming up and, 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 and basically, um, well, uh, that is the place where you can follow the information on the, yes, what's, what is in the pipeline. Um, so then how can the course lists from our server be imported to the OLA tool for students to choose from? Or do they have to type the course uh, names, ECTS, et cetera, et cetera? Um, here I will again uh, give the floor to Joao to comment on the uh, course catalog implementation. Um, thanks for this question. I think it's one of our favorite features. So in the context of the previous OLA project, uh, there was an API that was released that enables you to connect your course catalog. It's something that we've made live demo every, uh, during a conference. Um, we are looking to upgrade that API in the context of the current project. And uh, you can check the technical documentation on this insofar that it's a technical implementation that enables you to turn on this functionality at the Open Source University Alliance, which is a micro side of the EWP. Um, I would actually invite all the colleagues to consider doing this because the feedback we got from students is that this would be of uh, very great added value. 
Uh, thank you so much. And the next most popular question that now jumped up uh, is about the digital signatures in the dashboard um, being quite cumbersome and why should it be compulsory at all? Um, maybe if, uh, if our colleagues from the European Commission would want to comment on this first and then also uh, from the technical team uh, from, yeah, from OILA Consortium. Uh, yeah, sure. So I assume whoever asked this question, oh, this is Harpa from the Commission, by the way. Uh, I assume that whoever answered that question is referring to the function that we now have with the mouse that you move to make a digital signature. And of course, I understand that this is uh, not a very uh, elegant system, maybe, so to say. I mean, the, uh, no offense to those that uh, developed it, but there are now more user-friendly solutions that are in the pipeline. And this is sort of the click to sign features that I think were referenced uh, here before. So indeed, we are switching to a more, uh, a simpler system. Of course, we are, going to make the next program, the management of the next program digital. And we're trying to achieve a paper-free mobility management where you can manage the entire process um, uh, digitally. So printing out and having normal signatures is, is not an option. So digital signatures uh, as such should become the norm in the next, in the next program. And this is uh, some of the new features that are being uh, looked into. Of course, as you may have spotted uh, today, this whole project, the European Student Card Initiative and the Erasmus Without Paper project is also a bigger and more long-term project. So you see in parallel as the project partners are working on implementing um, new updates uh, for, the, for the next program, they're also thinking more term, uh, more long-term and constantly looking into and investigating uh, further solutions that could be even more secure, more user-friendly. Um, so it's a it's an ongoing uh, process that we are are working on. So the digital signatures that you see now are just the the system that we have now, and then we are uh, working towards improving it and making it more uh, secure uh, in line with the Commission's overall digitalization strategy. Uh, but why should it be compulsory at all? I mean, this is a, indeed the question that we I mean we sat down and asked ourselves this question: Should we make this compulsory? Yes or no? Um, and Ultimately, the answer was yes, based on the feedback that we got from uh, universities, that it's extremely important that everybody is using the same standards um, and connected to the same communication channel when it comes to uh, managing and implementing this digital workflow. Uh, if we have people using uh, different standards, um, then we run into the problem of not having a streamlined process and which is a solution to an existing problem where everybody's using their own uh, signatures and standards uh, today. So yeah, I think from my side that would be would be the comment. Uh, we there will be a new easier click to sign uh, digital signatures uh, coming your way. Also for the students in the context of the Erasmus Plus mobile app. Um, there, there is another project. I saw some colleagues were asking about Edugain, both in Slido and in the chat box. Um, Edugain is um, an identity federation, so to say, um, that is being utilized in the context of the My Academic ID project to create a European student-wide EID. Now, this is super, super uh, complex, but um, to just sort of give a, a simple message to everyone listening, um, those universities and those students that have access to Edugain, which on average is around 80 to 90 percent of the student population in Europe, will be able to sign uh, into the app and sign learning agreements using the My Academic ID feature. Those students that do not have access to Edugain because their universities are, are not uh, members or don't have access to it, uh, there will be some fallback options that, um, that can be used for having a click to sign feature that is not, not based on the Edugain and My Academic ID authentication. Um, so yeah, that was just a, a quick summary uh, from, from our side, but I'm sure that uh, Daika and the other colleagues uh, in the project can maybe give more details here. Um, thank you so much. I, I think it was uh, really a great summary of, of yeah, illustrating of where we are there and, and, and what's the plan. And indeed, as um, our technical team already illustrated, the click to sign is, is the way we are planning to further advance it. And given the time, uh, time limit, we'll have to wrap up. But uh, just very briefly, the last two questions from my side. Um, 
the first one on online learning agreement and how it is connected to the Rasmus Plus app. And the short answer, um, the similar fashion as it's already connected now will also uh, be available for the updated Rasmus Plus app. So it's the shared authentication solution, the logins uh, for both are basically the same. And also students having easy access to the updates and, and knowing what is happening and uh, basically having the app as a single point of entry will also allow them to follow and uh, follow up the process of the learning agreement finalization. Um, and yes, and then uh, having an account in a dashboard does not mean that we are using it. It's for testing purposes. And we work with the Mobility Online and would want to, uh, to use it also for the OILA. Um, well, it's a statement, not really a question. And with that, I would also um, again remind about the survey that we carried out. And that also was, uh, was an illustration. And, and uh, you can see the, uh, the overview among the countries of, of how people are testing and how people are using officially already introducing the learning agreement system. And um, so you'll see more details there. And, and I again would uh, uh, hint to go to the EUF website and uh, you'll find the survey results and survey analysis in the resources section. Um, and um, so uh, the last one on Edugain, I see, uh, I, see I, I got the internal comment uh, that, uh, that I would want to comment on that. And with that, I would actually be say, saying goodbye from my side already. But Joao, please, please take the floor. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Since this was one of the recommendations regarding the next step, I think it's fair to cover the question to the extent possible. So as Daniel mentioned, or Arco mentioned, Edugain is a federation. And that means that in every country, there is a national research and education um, institution responsible for managing the systems. And so, depending on the country you're in, uh, make sure to check the Edugain website. You will find the contacts for this NRINS, that's the acronym they used, and um, you can get in touch with them to you know, assess what's the, the, the onboarding process. It might differ slightly from country to country, um, but to our knowledge, it's typically not exactly rocket science. And it's a very important part of making the system more secure, more robust, insofar that it eradicates the need to have duplicate accounts or accounts that are not linked to the student status. So thank you for the question. Thank you all for participating. And uh, that's it from our side as well. Uh, I don't know if Krem or Arpo want to just say some closing words. Uh, maybe just, uh, yeah, I wanted to point out that, uh, and you actually would know the answer to this more than me, Joao, but I know that on the Competence Center, you have published uh, a blueprint um, for universities on how to connect to Educane or like a simple step-by-step -step process, what that means. So um, again, like we do in all webinars, I strongly encourage everyone listening to go to the Erasmus Without Paper Competence Center and go through uh, all of the documents, FAQs, videos, uh, and guidelines that are posted there. One of them is indeed uh, on the issue of Edugain that I read myself recently. Um, I also had spotted a question um, regarding the interinstitutional agreements. Uh, somebody was asking, I don't have the question now in front of me, it was posted on Slido, but they said, uh, yeah, now that we had reshuffled the roadmap, what does it mean for the current existing agreements? So what happened as a result of the COVID-19 situation, the testing period for the interinstitutional agreements was extended until October 2020. So it means now that if you did not have the time to test the interinstitutional agreement manager, um, you can do so now and provide us your feedback in a survey that will be sent to everyone uh, registered on the dashboard in October. Um, the interinstitutional agreement manager that is uh, available on the dashboard follows the same logic as the online learning agreements. You don't have to use the dashboard to set up uh, digital interinstitutional agreements. You just need to make sure that your system, uh, IT system that you're using or your service provider is connected to the network and then you have the interoperability there. Um, but now, since we were extending the testing period, this also had a knock on effect on the valid validity of the current interinstitutional agreements. So to allow for a smooth transition period from the current program to the next one, uh, the commission has announced, and this has been sent formally to national agencies and is as well, as well updated on our website, the European Student Card Initiative website, uh, that the validity of the current um, 
agreement is extended by one year. So that's why you saw in the roadmap in the slides that uh, Elena presented this morning that we put 2022 as the as the year when the interinstitutional agreements will become man, uh, mandatory. That means again that student mobilities that are being funded with funds from the call 2022, i.e. academic year 2022-2023 should be uh, sent on the basis of digital interinstitutional agreements. So essentially you have a, an extra year to set up and renew all of your agreements. Now, the planning is this, in October, we will have the survey. We will process the feedback from that survey, the commission together with the project partners involved, and as well uh, our working groups and the digital officers that we have in all of the national agencies as well, uh, and national authorities, um, to see what uh, further improvements or adaptations might be needed. And then the plan is as of January 2021, the system will be ready. Everyone can um, start using it to actively renew interinstitutional agreements. But you know, you would have uh, approximately a year to do so because it's not mandatory to have them signed until you start sending students for the, the academic year 2022-2023 um, with call 2022 funds. So I hope that that uh, clarified the interinstitutional agreement uh, issue. Um, and uh, with that, um, I would just simply say thank you to uh, my colleagues and to everyone that uh, attended the webinar today for your um, attention and for all of your uh, questions. Um, I think, uh, yeah, from our side, that was it. Uh, anything else from EUF side before we wrap up? No, essentially, thank everyone for participating and wishing everyone a fantastic summer. Looking forward to the start of the next academic year. And we hope it will be an exciting one to that. So thanks as well for, uh, to you, Graham, Elena, for joining and for all your uh, support and clarifications. And um, I hope to see you all very soon. Have a great time.